Good evening and welcome to the Wood Avenue Church of Christ. For those who might be visiting with us, for our members, welcome back this evening. If you're online, we are definitely appreciative of you being attentive to our uh, our worship this evening. And uh, it's it's definitely been a, a great day. The weather's been nice. I was working on my lesson, sitting on my back porch and not sweating. So we're getting into that time of year for sure. Um, I, I got a little nervous, not going to lie, driving in. There's so many cars out in the parking lot. I said, surely these people did not show up to uh, hear me today. But I know there's the festival across in the parking lot, and many folks are there. If you were visiting with us after being at the festival, we are glad to have you as well. But uh, we are going to get into the book of Romans, looking at the 14th chapter. And in the book of Romans, we see that the church here was likely made up of a lot of people that probably did not know the one true God at some point. These people did not grow up in a Jewish household. They didn't know the prophecies. They didn't know the, uh, the, the things that God would have passed down, those oracles to his people. But somewhere down the line, most likely in the dispersion uh, out of Jerusalem, there was someone that made their way west towards Israel, from Israel, and they started evangelizing, and now we read of the church here in Rome. Much of Paul's letter is about understanding and what it means to be unified by Christ. It also teaches about how our attitude toward one another should be as we're going to be looking here in Romans chapter 14. With everyone's spiritual knowledge and understanding at a, at a different level, people were being judged from within the congregation. So Paul writes here, and he writes about this in Romans chapter 14. So look with me in verse 1. It says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. In Romans chapter 14, looking at that first verse there, I want to pull a few verses from this, but looking at that first verse, I feel a sense of being susceptible in this idea here that the church here is probably a little susceptible to certain things now they're certainly susceptible to the truth they have heard the truth they have come together as a congregation they have been susceptible to that but also possibility of false teachings they they grew up in an area most likely dominated by a lot of mythology and things of that nature and worshiped many gods and possibly even with the thought of the one true God in there somewhere, but not him as the one true God and only God. But they needed teaching. This Roman church, these Christians in Rome needed some teaching. With the gospel promise beginning with the Jews, the people of Rome are now hearing the salvation of Christ for the first time. It seems that they lacked some form of understanding of what they had heard and what they chose to believe and their commitment in that. If that is the case, teaching without reproof opens up the door for false teachings. They're susceptible to the word, but teaching without reproof is only going to bring false teachings amongst that congregation and can in any congregation. We know that's true because of the stories we hear of churches splitting and things of that nature. But Paul writes to teach, but also correct the existing Roman Christians on how to help each other. We see the idea that some here are quick to judge, and that was their problem, while some were weak in the faith. If you have some who are quick to judge and others who are weak in the faith, that is asking for a recipe for disaster. But then we skip ahead to verse 4, which said, Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. We are to stand in the Lord, stand in his strength, and we are uplifted by him. This is not our doing, but it's God's doing. It's the power of God in our lives that allows us to stand, stand up for our faith, stand firm in the faith. 
You get a sense of plurality when you read verse 4 there. How we are to stand together in Christ. If one man stands alone, well, he might be able to withhold a, a few rocks. But if many stand together, they can withhold a mountain, as one has said in the past. The existing Christians in Rome may have been more of a Bible thumper kind of evangelist congregation where some in the congregation were still weak in their faith. Sharing the gospel news could have easily been viewed as harsh or critical and even seen in that case possibly today. How some people want to be more Bible thumpers and beat the Bible into you than bringing it forth to you and letting the word do the work. Sharing the gospel is vital to our mission on this earth and what God had intended and what Jesus had promised for them to do, told his apostles to do in Matthew 28. So God has given us the foundation to stand firm on our faith. If we have that king of the hill attitude we played as kids, a congregation will not succeed when one person's trying to stand on top of another. But the thing is, that king of the hill is only reserved for one individual, and that is Jesus himself. It is the Lord that makes us to stand, and we do so by following his word. Look at verse 5 now. The beginning part there in verse 5 tells us a little something about these people. Verse 5 says, One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. In that first part there, we are to look at that, and I, I can only think of that's supposed to be a church united under Christ. Sweeping our nation, we hear division, people may be jumping congregations or even swapping denominations for another. A large part is how people interpret scripture. There might be other reasons as well, but when we do not find a commonality in scripture, we leave room for division. We leave room for people to leave that congregation or to swap denominations altogether. Discerning scripture isn't hard, but it's difficult when people read it two different ways. And sometimes that's how people choose to be. Paul is telling them to get on the same page. We need to be on the same page with what scripture is telling us, with what Christ has given for us to do. The same page that is being a part of his church and being with one accord with one another. After all, Jesus died so that we can only be one body of believers. We are blessed here in the Shoals area to have so many congregations of a like-minded belief in scripture and, and many doctrines. But whether it is one building of people or many dozen couples uh, of, of congregations in this area, the task is still the same. Unity in the word and in Christ is vital to our survival. Then you look at the rest of verse 5 there. In that second half, it tells us to fully, be fully convinced in his own mind. Convinced of what? I, I, I looked at this for a little while and I was trying to figure it out. And, and it just falls in verse 6 through 8 there of what we're supposed to do. So read with me verse 6. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor for the Lord and gives thanks to God. For God, or sorry, for none of us live for himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. The idea here and how we are convinced in our own mind fully is that we are not our own. We are not our own. We are the Lord's in all aspects of life. Whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, do all in the name of the Lord. If we chose to go about life without God running the show, we live a life that neglects God. I don't believe we intentionally choose to try to neglect God in our daily lives. For people who believe in God, they would not want to say that they neglect God. But it seems that we call on God most when we are at the highs in life and the lows in life. But what about the in-between? 
The in-between seems to fade sometimes. The in-between seems to be where it's a struggle. In my opinion, for me, that is the toughest place to be. That is the toughest place that we can find ourselves as Christians in the comfortable place. If we're too comfortable with what we are doing in the pews that we sit in, with the lessons we hear at home when, we're, when we don't have anything else to do, but we just choose to watch TV all day, wherever we might be, work or school, if we are in the in-between and God is not there with us, we are struggling. We struggle to acknowledge him. What we can do is intentionally recognize him in all that we do. Colossians 3.17 that we just mentioned, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord, but giving thanks to God the Father through him. Are you thankful for God and what he's done in your life? Are you thankful for the blessings he's given you? We do not need to neglect what he has done for us. So skip with me to verse 12 here. And talking about how these Christians here were struggling and what they were doing and the judgment that was being passed on to them within the body, verse 12 gives this idea of, I guess, some absolute. It says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. It's short, it's sweet, but it's very specific. God's judgment is absolute. We get to have a lot of redos, it seems like, in life with, with many things. Some things you can't redo, but it seems like we can have a lot of redos in life. But eternity doesn't give you second chances. We get those chances now to make it right and to live a better life in realizing when we fall short. And given an account of ourselves, can we say that we were completely faithful to God? God understands that we are flawed and gives us mercy to those who ask. But do you ask? And do you ask enough? Because temptation's always out there. So in looking at Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12, what does a judgmental heart make you out to be? I think the rest of the verse, the rest of chapter 14 kind of gives us that idea. And that's a stumbling block. And we know what the Bible says about a stumbling block, but they figuratively shut the door on opportunities to help each other and help unbelievers because of their judgmental hearts. And that's kind of what it seems like was going on here in the book of Romans and at the church here in Rome. Whether they were in the church or even outside of the church, it seems like the door was kind of being shut on some and not on everybody else. Uh, when I was a kid, I actually raced BMX bicycles on a dirt track. And I mean, you're ta looking at me going, how is that even possible? But I used to do that, and, and uh, myself and about 15 other riders would line up on that line, and, and the gate would, would close on us, and we're going down this steep hill, and we're riding neck and neck with each other, going around these tight turns. So naturally, as you can imagine, you know, people might fall. Sometimes I might believe that it was mostly Josh Ross the cause of those, those little collisions there. But there was not a warning flag as you came around that turn to slow down. And, and there was uh, very little time for an instinct to, to dodge that person that might be down or even get out of the way of the people that are about to run you over. But too often I would find that I got caught up in the bunch and the dominoes would just fall. It's almost as if it seemed like sometimes someone's trying to just throw a log or a stick or something out in front of you just to knock you over. But that's how it was. Anyone that went down would obviously hinder you to finish that race. So in reading verse 13 and looking about that stumbling block, the context points to these people who are Christians yet stumbling because of a brother or sister in Christ. We were all in that race trying to finish, but who would finish first is what the goal was. But it was a good day if no one went down, but that rarely happened. If you talk about Christianity, it's a good day when we all stand together, when we all finish the race. It doesn't necessarily matter who finishes first or last, but that we are all going to get there. You can be the safest driver on the road doing everything you're supposed to, but you can't control everybody around you. You can't control the vehicles next to you. Not everyone else may drive the same way you do. And unfortunately, sometimes the other drivers might be that unbeliever who would 
uh, stumble in front of you, or a Christian even in the church who might stumble in front of you, people who would try to bring you down for what you believe. Sometimes it's unintentional. Sometimes it's with every intention to do your spiritual life harm. People are out there looking to do harm, and some people have to be on watch for that. So let's look at some simple fixes for a judgmental heart so that we can walk in a way that is better for us, in a more righteous path. So looking at this, take the time to get the Bible, the biblical understanding for yourself. And I think sometimes we, we that's an area that we might neglect, an area that we might struggle. But Proverbs chapter 4, verses 5 through 6 gives us some, some wisdom there, some insight. Proverbs 4 Verse 5 says, get wisdom, get insight. Do not forget and do not turn away from the word for words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her and she will guard you. It seems all too easy to get caught up in what we're doing, to neglect some parts of scripture or, or maybe just not really take the time to get into it, but we need to be people who are searching out wisdom, to get insight, to not forget what we're called to do, to not forget who we're called to serve, not forget the mission. If we do so, she will guard us, that wisdom. God will guard us in all things. But along with getting biblical wisdom and seeking out that understanding that we need, we don't need to get it caught up in being one who judges like we saw many in the church in Rome. Judgment based on biblical principle is not always a bad thing. But the Roman Christians held this over one another. God gives us an idea of what biblical principle and biblical judgment is. But Proverbs 16 Verse 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. We, knew, we know all too well of what pride can do for one. It's a downfall and it's a stumbling block for any who has it. We know all too well in how it can destroy a congregation and how it tears apart the idea that we are in a church that's run and head and the headed by Christ. But then you read Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. I like that in the ESV version here, it says to see clearly. I, I, I'm waiting for the day when the doctor's going to tell me that I need uh, glasses. I don't wear glasses or contacts, and I mean, there's plenty else wrong with me, but I don't wear glasses or contacts, I'm kind of worried for that day. But... In a big way, it's only going to help me in the long run. Whether I'm driving, whether I'm writing something down, however it works, it can only help me to see more clearly. When it comes to scripture and what we are trying to understand, when we see more clear, when we have an open heart but a heart based around doctrine and, and biblical principle, we see more clear. And that can only be good for us. We need to be Christians who choose to see more clear the bigger picture that God has laid out for us. Another idea here is that we need to work as one who belongs to the Lord, that we belong to the Lord. Knowing that we belong to the Lord is, is the greatest benefit that we can uh, be found in. And in Isaiah 43, verse 1, it tells us, But now this says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. By redeeming us, a price was paid. With the price that was paid, he claims us as his own. If we don't belong to God, all that is left available is the world. 
but the world will see, so the only option is to live for Christ. James 4.4 4 says that uh, friendship with the world is enmity to God, making you an enemy towards the Father. We need to live for Christ. And in living for Christ, do and follow his commands. Helping one another, sharing with one another, and how we can get to be where we need to be in our walk. Which brings us to the next idea. Create healthy Christian relationships. Healthy Christian relationships are what's going to get us through this life. If we do it alone, it's going to be extremely difficult. When I was... A student at Fried Hardeman University, the biggest thing, the greatest thing I could have done, the best thing I had done was plug myself into a congregation in the area. It wasn't necessarily the congregation that was right across the street because there's literally a, a, a large congregation right across the street, Henderson Church of Christ, and great people there. But I found a church about 20 minutes away that allowed me to be plugged in, to, to teach classes with the, the middle and high school classes, to get up there and do song lead every now and then. And those things that they allowed me to do to allow me to be plugged in with them are about the greatest things that I did not foresee coming. It gave me a, a group of people to rely on. And, and when some tough times had come for uh, myself or maybe others, that congregation was willing to lend a hand. But that's what the church is designed to do, not just for a college student at the time, not just for uh, anybody who's struggling, but to always help in any need for people in this building and out of this building. By redeeming us, he, uh, a price was paid, and with that price being paid, he claims us his own, and we are entered into that congregation, that, that body of believers that is the church. Look at, back at Romans chapter 14. Verse 19, this point taken directly from our passage here, it says, So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Peace is obviously something to, to grasp. Jesus says in what we call the Beatitudes is be a peacemaker. To work in being a peacemaker, but doing so for mutual upbuilding. What is going to benefit the person sitting next to you or on the, on the other side of the building? What is going to benefit the congregation here at Wood Avenue? What is going to benefit the church in mutual upbuilding? We need to be people who are mutually working to build one another up in love and good deeds. We are always doing so, and if we are patient sometimes with one another, that going a long way, it makes the job a little easier. Sometimes it's hard to be patient. Sometimes people don't really seem to, uh, you don't really seem to want to give them patience because they might be difficult with you. But patience is one of the greatest things that God has given us in his attributes. Many other things too, but patience goes a long way. James 1.19 says, Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. It's nothing you haven't heard before. Slow to, or quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. What better advice can we take when it comes to being patient with one another, being patient in our relationships with one another? Judgment is God's business. The judgment that we see here in Rome was not quite the judgment that we need to be sharing in. God has given us an idea of what biblical judgment is, and that's discerning through the word and how we go about those things. But judgment is God's business. And he has given us the means to judge certain situations. But being a stumbling block, that's the devil's game. Sometimes we dabble in the devil's game too much. It's so simple to fall into that trap. So simple that you see it back in the fall of man. Adam and Eve were in the garden and God told them that you shall surely die if you eat of this tree. But then the devil played his game and added the word not. You shall not surely die. And through one word and the actions of two people is why we now sit here and why Jesus came to this earth to die on that cross. We don't need to be playing and dabbling in the devil's game. We need to be in the business of what God would have us to do. Judging what we're supposed to do. Discerning through scripture how we need to live this life. Building up one another so that we 
can see good works and that we can do good things in his name. Christians sometimes like to mess with and even abuse the margin of error, it seems like, when it comes to our spiritual walk. We like to be on that balance beam or get too close to the edge. And sometimes if you're a little too close to the edge, sometimes you fall in the wrong direction. Sometimes we find ourselves dabbling in the devil's game or allowing sin into our lives. And it can be so small or it can be something so great, but the devil's always at work. I promise if you sit on the line, sin, sin is going to creep in. How long can we abuse God's grace and the blood of Jesus before it's too late? How long can we neglect the faith that we are supposed to follow in? For all of us with breath in our lungs, there is time. There is time to work on it. As long as we have breath in our lungs, we are to be working in what we are supposed to do, what scripture would have us to do, and what Jesus told us to do. And that is going out, seeking to save the lost, but also working in this congregation, working in this church, working in the Shoals area, working abroad, wherever you might be, because there are souls to be saved. And Jesus knew that and uh, commissioned us to do so. If you have not walked according to the words in this book, why do you wait? Why do you tarry so long? By putting off the old and living a life in Christ, it is the greatest gift that he has given us. He's done so through his son, Jesus, who went to the cross, his blood that was shed that cleanses us from those sins. And we come in contact with that blood in the pools of baptism. But sometimes we neglect the gift. Why do you wait? If you have become a Christian and have strayed away, forgiveness is readily available from the Lord. It is readily available for those who you might have hurt. Maybe you are just hurt by the things that you've allowed in your lives. And we would love to work with you and help you in any situation that you might find yourself struggling in. Whatever your need be, we ask that you would come right now and stand as we sing this song.